barbershop and there was a Puerto Rican cat there named Sammy. And uh, he seen the crown on my neck and he asked me about it. And uh, he's like, yeah, one of my friends, is he's a Land King from Chicago. And I was like, oh, really? And he's like, I'm gonna introduce you to him, blah, blah, blah. And, and he ended up introducing me to him, uh, Big Louie. And Louie introduced me to Tito. Tito introduced me to KB. And they were all part of Rough Riders. My whole life, I've always wanted to be part of something or fit in. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was involved with so many gangs throughout my life. My whole life, I've been involved with party crews, gangs, you know, uh, just groups of individuals that are up to no good, pretty much. So I got involved with the Rough Riders. You know, I didn't even know how to ride a bike, but I wanted to be one. I wanted to be a Rough Rider. I wanted to have the camaraderie. I wanted to be with a bunch of guys. And uh, I hit it off pretty, you know, with KB, he's from Chicago, he's an ex-SD, and hit it off with Tito, Knox, and, um, you know, they made me a prospect. You have to prospect for at least a year before you even become a full vested member and, um, and, and have a bike. I didn't even have a bike, didn't even know how to ride a fucking bike. Uh, and I would always tell them that I knew DMX, and, you know, I don't think Tito even believed me. He'd always say, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I would invite him over there to go to his house, and and I introduced him to uh, DMX, and DMX seen me, you know, wearing a, a Rough Rider shirt that said Prospect on the back, and he was like, "Nah, you know, he's not a prospect. He's been a Rough Rider since day one. You know, uh, he's always had my back. Blah blah blah." So they vested me the next day. I became a full Rough Rider, and. I had to go buy a bike because I didn't have one. So I got a bike and I started riding. Uh, I can honestly say that those five years were the, the five years that I had the most fun in my life. Um, we would get on our bikes at about 10 in the morning. We would go to every single strip club in Phoenix throughout the day. And you know, still at two in the morning would be at the strip club uh, doing Drugs, drinking, fucking strippers. Everybody loved us. As soon as we would walk into the strip club, they would play the Rough Rider anthem, the song by DMX, and they would play my uh, brother's A.O. Kato song. You know, as, as soon as we would walk into places, uh, the people loved us. They loved our energy. They loved uh, who we were. Then when we would bring DMX around even more because the place got so busy, and um, it was it was a good time for the the bike scene was in it, it, now there's like over sixty bike clubs in Chicago and uh, Chicago Phoenix. And, uh, Phoenix, you know there's there's a lot of bike clubs out there now, but back in that back in those days I can honestly say Rough Riders was the one that put were the 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 ones that opened the door to that whole era of of bike scene. Thing. I mean, we were the first, actually, club with, you know, we have different races. We had, you know, blacks, whites, Mexicans. Um, we, we got invited to their, to their bars, to their clubhouse, to their runs. You know, they, they took a really big liking to us. And, you know, when I got arrested by the feds, that was like the number one question they kept coming in and asking me is, uh, what, what are you guys doing for the Hells Angels? Are you guys uh, running drugs, get, uh, guns? What are you doing? What are you doing? And to me, it was funny because we weren't doing shit. We were just, I guess you could say, like, we were just that popular guy that everybody wanted to be friends with. Yeah, I mean, we were, we were, we were coming to their clubhouse, and, and you know, I, one of my boy, uh, E, he was the blackest dude you could possibly, you know, and we were coming into their clubhouses, and we were hanging out with them at the bars that they hung out in Mesa, Phoenix, you know, uh, Carefree, because that's one of their, you know, that's when uh, their big uh, leader uh, lived out that way. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I like the whole structure, the whole, you know, 
it's different to be in a, in a bike club that's just like a lifestyle than to be in a bike club that is actually a gang. Rules are set in place. There's structure. So Rough there's, Riders wasn't like that? No, no, you know, I, and I, 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 you know, I, there was times where we would be out and I would be, you know, in my head I would think I would be like, man, I would really, I would, I would want to be part of something like that, you know, and, and then I would have to like kind of pull myself back because I was actually, well, I, I never interacted with a Mongo in, in the free world, but when I was in, I, I uh, never interacted with no Mongols in, in the free world, but when I was in Vegas, uh, they had me in the uh, gang unit. It's underground. It's a new prison that they built. And they happened to have a, a real big gang fight where the Bloods and the Crips got into it, and they had to double cell all these people in their unit where everybody single celled. Um, and I was left... And there was a Mongol upstairs. He was from Vegas, and he was going to get some time because he was involved with that whole Laughlin thing. And um, not the Texas thing, the Laughlin. Thing. Yeah, the Texas thing was really crazy. Yeah, no, no, no the Laughlin thing. He was going to get some time, and I guess he was going through some shit where he would like beat up all his cellmates, or you know, he 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 was a wild one. And um, I don't know, something just told me that. I don't know if it was that I was desperate to have some interaction with somebody because I had already been by myself for like six months or something in my heart just told me that, you know, I just needed to be around this dude. Was he, excuse me, how big and intimidating was he? He was a big guy. He was a little intimidating. He had that whole biker look, you know what I mean? Big guy. I asked the sergeant to put me in there with him and... He's like, oh, you know, I can't. And, then, you know, and I was, I kept bothering him about it. And he's, he's like, well, you got to sign a paper if I put it in there that, you know, if something happens to you, it's, it's, you know, not our fault. And, um. You don't remember this guy's name? Yeah, I remember his name. Give me some Mouth. Oh, you don't know his real name. No, that's, no. Oh. That's his nickname. <laughs> I don't ask for real names. M-O-U-T-H, <laughs> mouth? Yeah. And it was because he had a really big mouth. I mean, he would fuck. I used to like, I used to stare out my my little window and he was upstairs and I would all day I would just it was comedy how much he would fuck with the with the cops the CEOs when they would walk by his door he would hit the door he would always scare them or scream at them and tell them you'll never take me alive coppers like he was just constantly fucking with them and it was just comical how he would get under their skin, like comical. Um, and he was the troublemaker of the unit. Um, it, it's funny because when they moved me up there and he was like quiet for like three days straight, they actually, the, the sergeant and, and the head like guy of the unit actually came upstairs to check on him and see like what was, what was, what was wrong. Why he had been so quiet for the past three days. And, you know, the, the funny part is that when I moved up there, um, he didn't know nothing about religion, man. He didn't know. I'm not a very religious person, but I know who Jesus is. I know, you know, I, I know pretty much the basics. And, you know, I taught him about being positive, I taught him to play chess, I taught him to work out, I taught him how to box. We would box with the sandals. Um... Just pretty much, I don't know, I feel, I feel like I gave him a breath of, of air. And he, he became a different person in, those, in that month that we spent together. When he got sent to the left, um, it was very, very, uh, it was hard for me too. Him, I think him more because he, he broke down. And to see a big guy like that, it's, you know, you know it's, it's considered somebody very dangerous to break down, uh, you know, when he, when he left and, and he got taken away, uh, you know, he just, he just said thank you for everything. And it was a very, it was, it was a big moment.